Walt Disney Pictures and Steven Spielberg present a brand new maroon cartoon. Roger Rabbit and Baby Herman are back, and this time they're going wild in the woods. Need any help, little camper? It's the funniest camping trip ever. And a monument to Toon Entertainment. Trail Mix-Up. Remember, only you can prevent forest fires. Rated G, and you can only see it with a far-off place rated PG. Starts Friday, March 12th. Welcome, one and all, to a very special guest choice episode of Escape from Vault Disney, the podcast where we review movies, TV shows, and short films available on Disney+, Plus, usually chosen completely at random. I am your host, Tony Goldmark. Joining today in person is Sydney Agnew. Jessica Rabbit is my bisexual awakening. Luke Ski. Shakespeare, and I'm a rabbit. You figure it out. And the guest choice guest of honor himself, Kyle Carosa. All the time you yanked my ears. And like I said, this episode is a guest choice episode. Be our guest choice. Be our guest choice. Put our service to the test choice. In which we temporarily bypass the randomizer and watch what one of my guests wants us to watch. In this case, the very awesome Kyle Carosa. Kyle, as you know... After you've been on this show 10 times, ten times, you get one guest choice option and you will only ever get one guest choice option. You have chosen this week to use it and you've chosen to make us watch the Roger Rabbit shorts. So, of yes, course, sir. now, Kyle, the question must be, why the Roger Rabbit shorts? Well, not only am I a huge fan of these, just kind of in a general guy who likes Roger Rabbit sense, as has been well documented, perhaps more elsewhere, I'm a big fan of Mr. Bill Cop, the creator of Schnookums and Meat and Mad Jack the Pirate and co-creator and voice of Eek the Cat. At this point, when he worked on these shorts, he would have been fresh off of animating the Tracy Ullman Simpsons shorts. Oh, cool. This is a combination of him and Pat Ventura and Lynn Naylor in the story department making nice. the funnies. And I've always just liked how these were like, hey, what if... Instead of most of the money, Tex Avery had all of the money to make yeah. his animated shorts. These shorts were kind of ingenious because, of course, 1988, Who Framed Roger Rabbit comes out. It's a huge hit. And it's got this built-in mythos where Roger Rabbit is a cartoon star. And we see in the opening few minutes, something's cooking, which it might be hard for you youngins to remember the dark days of animation in the 70s <laughs> and 80s. But until Roger Rabbit came out, no one was making violent cartoons anymore. No one was right. making cartoony cartoons like the kind you see in the first few minutes of Roger Rabbit. That's why it was so important for those few minutes to be the quintessential old school, violent Tom and Jerry, Tex Avery, Bob Clampett style cartoon to establish this is the throwback we're attempting here. Nowadays, of course... The Paul Rudish Mickey Mouse shorts are more violent than something's cooking. Well, right. So, <laughs> so even Disney itself, which for decades was the most boring milk toast cartoons there were, now is almost leading the way in that regard. Part of what started the new cartoon renaissance was the combined forces of Roger Rabbit and then furthermore the Roger Rabbit shorts where it's not just about the Mary Poppins situation. Right. Like, it's not know. just about combining live action and animation and that wizardry. It's just about doing the same kind of fun cartoon shenanigans that we saw in the first few minutes. It's basically like, to oversimplify, what if Warner Brothers style writing had Disney level animation, Disney Absolutely. feature level animation. Right. So yeah. there was stuff like this. And there was Mighty Mouse and New Adventures. There was a pup named Scooby-Doo, which itself led to Tiny Toons as Mighty Mouse then led to Ren and Stimpy. I feel like these are a key element of the big influx of stuff that led to cartoony coming back. And at the same time, you had, as you mentioned earlier, The Simpsons yeah. coming to primetime, which at least at the beginning was a very different kind of animation. It didn't have the budget of these, obviously, at first. Right. It was a nice simultaneous adjunct to more cartoony stuff like this because it said, hey, animation can be many things. Yeah, things like Roger Rabbit and The Simpsons were kind of for adults the same way Tex Avery cartoons were for adults. But with directors who weren't nearly as self-loathing. Right. So <laughs> Hopefully. It kind of boggles my mind that on Tex Avery's deathbed, he was saying, I wasted my life making these stupid cartoons. It's like, dude, you made the best stupid cartoons ever. Be proud of yourself, man. He had a rough time he, and I, I wish he had the same confidence about his work that Chuck Jones absolutely had. Yes. 
So like I said, Disney had a huge hit on their hands with Roger Rabbit. They've got this built-in mythology where it's perfectly natural for Roger Rabbit to spin off into his own shorts, which Disney had always resisted that sort of thing because after Snow White came out, people were saying to Walt, hey, you can do a bunch of dopey cartoons. Just have dopey get into shenanigans or the other six dwarves. And Walt was like, I don't want to follow pigs with pigs because he didn't want to do a Three Little Pigs sequel either. The company now has a very different philosophy, of course. Also, interestingly, at the same time, Fleischer would have actually opted for that by taking their sure, character sure. Gabby from Gulliver's Travels and making several shorts with him. Yeah. Unfortunately, it was a crappy character, so it yeah, didn't go anywhere. But still, the heart was in the right place. But Walt always said, if I make a bunch of dopey cartoons, that's just going to cheapen the movie. So for years, both when he was in charge and when they went through the What Would Walt Have Done era, they always resisted that on their animated features. Except for when he put Figaro in mini cartoons. That is true. That's the one exception to that, I guess. And the other exception, I guess, is Winnie the Pooh, just because that was always a series of shorts. Mm. But here with Roger Rabbit, you had the framing device of the movie. This was a star of animated shorts. There's no reason not to make more animated shorts and put them in front of our other feature films. The first of these shorts, Tummy Trouble, came out the following year in theaters with Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. From Walt Disney Pictures, when Wayne Selinski accidentally shrinks his kids. Where are we? They must battle their way back to the one place they think is safe. They're going to head right for the house. Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, playing together with a special added attraction, Roger Rabbit's back in an all-new maroon cartoon with baby Herman and America's favorite nurse, Jessica. Thank goodness for modern medicine. Going up. Tummy Trouble, playing only with Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, rated PG. Now playing at a theater near you. Honey, I Shrunk the Kids was a much bigger hit than anyone was anticipating, and I think Tummy Trouble is at least partially to thank for that. I would agree. To the point where it was also released on the VHS tape of Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. In fact, all three of these Roger Rabbit shorts, I remember in the mid-90s, they put out a VHS tape of all three of them that I just wore out. Like, Me too. I watched yeah. it oh, yeah, I watched that thing over and over. Then they made a second short, Roller Coaster Rabbit, and the first two shorts, incidentally, were both directed by Rob Minkoff. Mm -hmm. who, of course, went on to co-direct The Lion King. You may well ask, well, these were so funny and so wonderful. Why didn't they keep making more of them? I discussed this in more detail when I was a guest on the How Did This Not Get Made podcast a while ago, where we discussed the unmade Roger Rabbit sequels. But one of the interesting quirks of Who Framed Roger Rabbit was that Eisner was so desperate to get Spielberg on board with that movie that he let Disney and Amblin split control of the characters 50-50. And so anything that came out that was Roger Rabbit related had to be approved by both companies. To this day, if you want to put Jessica Rabbit on a t-shirt, someone from Disney and someone from Amblin has got to sign off on it. So Spielberg had tremendous control over the character. There's kind of a similar situation with the Tiny Toons and Animaniacs characters, right, which right. is why you don't see more of them in crossovers. And with Roller Coaster Rabbit, there was a big disagreement of which movie it should be released with. It was coming out summer of 1990. Disney wanted it released with Dick Tracy. Spielberg wanted it released with Arachnophobia. Because Mm. obviously Arachnophobia was his movie. Amblin co-produced it with Hollywood Pictures. In fact, it was the first Hollywood Pictures film. And Disney was like, no, Dick Tracy is practically a ripoff of Roger Rabbit. It makes more sense to release (laughs) it with that. Ultimately, Disney had their way. It was released with Dick Tracy. It didn't help Dick Tracy's box office too much, unfortunately, in that case. And Arachnophobia didn't do very well that summer either. And I think Spielberg was just so angry at it he pulled a power move and canceled what at that point was the third Roger Rabbit short in production, which was called Hair in My Soup, H-A-R-E. Right, I've seen a couple of stills from the production of that. Like storyboards and such? There were two like actual completed looking images, probably test shots. They were that far along with it, wow. Hair in My Soup was planned to be released with The Rocketeer. But instead, Rocketeer had no Roger Rabbit short, would have gone perfectly with it because old time Hollywood. I think there were a few other shorts in production that he canceled sheerly out of petty bitterness. And then finally, in 1993, a third Roger Rabbit short managed to come out. It was called Trail Mix Up, directed by Barry Cook, who went on to co-direct Mulan. Mm. Released with the long forgotten, I think it was a Disney Amblin co-production called A Far Off Place, Mm -hmm. which was about a couple of kids wandering through Africa 
Here's how fucking little they promoted it. 1993, I was like 10 years old. I would have gone nuts over a fucking new Roger Rabbit short. I would have seen a far off place in theaters if it meant I could see a Roger Rabbit short. I didn't know it existed. They didn't plug it very well. I don't remember anything about the movie, but I'm pretty sure I went to see it so I could see Trail Mix Up. I went to see The NeverEnding Story 2 when I hadn't seen the first Mm NeverEnding Story so I could see Box Office Bunny. Same. Yeah. (laughs) I remember- Right down to not having seen the first NeverEnding Story? Yes. Okay. (laughs) So Trail Mix Up, I was first or second year of college at that point. I know I went to the movie theater and I paid to see some other movie that was out at the time that I wanted to see (laughs) and then snuck into the beginning of a far off place to see Trail Mix Up so that I could have seen it and then left the theater. There's no way I'm interested in the least about this far off place movie. I don't care. I want to see the Roger Rabbit short. And you know, I'm sure they released it with an Amblin film just to keep Spielberg happy. But it seems to me, objectively, the more obvious movie in 1993 that Disney was putting out to release Trail Mix-Up with was Super Mario Brothers, because Bob Hoskins was in it. It seemed like, just conceptually, that would have fit a lot better, but they needed to give Spielberg his baba, I guess. Man, what if they had just made one more cartoon and actually had a cartoon in front of both Dick Tracy and Arachnophobia? How (laughs) How would things have been different if they just kept making these cartoons? Like, what if... They had put Roller Coaster Rabbit in front of Arachnophobia and then actually made Pistol Pack and Possum. (laughs) Oh, well, we'll always have Bonkers. You know, Bonkers gets a lot of hate. I liked Bonkers. I have no idea if it holds up. You might have seen that art I posted recently. I just want to remake Bonkers. (laughs) Not the cop thing, necessarily. Sure, just like sure. the shorts that they tried to make. Right. They had the show already planned, and they made those to give them a setup and put those in. What was the name of that show? Raw Tunage. Raw Tunage, that's right. Bonkers had a killer theme song. Yes, it did. Shout out for that. Sydney, you've been noticeably quiet. Well, that's because I have literally no attachment to any of these shorts. <laughs> I did not know that they existed until maybe like a year ago. Have you seen <laughs> them? And I have not she seen them. She wasn't born yet. We're all old, okay? Uh, yeah, We're I, old! I, I didn't old. See well, Look how old we are. I'm excited that you get to see these for the first time. Having, that I'm you know, excited for, yeah. Are you someone who enjoys the movie Roger Rabbit? Oh my gosh, yes. It's a cinematic classic. I didn't see it until I was about eight. I had been on the attraction before at Disneyland, mm. obviously. It's of probably one of the greatest cues that we've ever designed and that and indie i would say are, yeah are those, two those of the are best. two of the best cues that have ever been designed i mean roger rabbit would kind of have to have the best cue because the line is so fucking slow on youtube there's a video of an entertainment tonight segment from when roger rabbit's cartoon spin first opened and it's leonard moulton and charles fleischer oh. riding roger rabbit and charles making all these jokes along the way no i don't do any movies unless there's a ride associated with them good career move yes they offered me silence of the lambs I say to myself, no ride. Name of the father, no ride. I'm not doing another movie until there's a good ride. See, they should have done What's the Attraction. Then there <laughs> yeah, would be there a Silence of the Lambs. There right. you go. Well, Silence of the Lambs would be more like an eatery, I think. But <laughs> And now, of course, they're redesigning the ride. To, I'm excited to, about to, that. To give Jessica, Jessica more, more of a leading role. Which I have mixed feelings on that because Jessica has never been a damsel in distress character ever. She was never I mean, she gets way. her revenge on the weasels in the ride. You see it, yeah, you, you know? Too. This is going to hurt you a lot more than it's going to hurt me. But also, you only see her twice in the ride. Oh, that's so true. I can I can get on board with wanting more of her. I mean, you mentioned Jessica Rabbit being your bisexual <laughs> awakening. The three heterosexual dudes on this podcast can <laughs> confirm. <laughs> you know, we can you know. confirm that we like her, not that we yes. have a bisexual awakening. Well, no, not bisexual, <laughs> but I think you know a, what we mean. As a kid, it was more of just like I really wanted to be her because she was just like so awesome. But then later on, I would think about it and it's just like, no, I was just very attracted to her. Randy Martin said on a previous episode of this podcast about Disney Channel stars that she grew up with. I didn't know what gay was yet, so I just thought, I really want to be friends with these girls. <laughs> Depending on the exact release date and my birthday, I was either 13 or 14 when Who Framed Roger Rabbit came out. So basically, let's throw the dart at the target and exactly hit Luke hitting puberty right when this movie comes out. It's like, okay, it's fine, it's fine. Yeah. The, the oh. shot where she, the she, when when she grabs happens. Eddie's tie and just says, do. <laughs> there we go. For me, Hit it's the it's, ceiling. It's, I'm going me. For me, it's do the me. Leg. Hi. <laughs> no, for me, it's the leg. It's just, oh yeah. Just peaks the leg. It's great. It's there. It's everything. It's that whole intro scene. That was just me going like, oh, so women are also beautiful. <laughs> 
You're listening to the Jessica Rabbit Thirst podcast. The The movie is just one of those movies that if you don't like it, then I do not want to be friends with you. (laughs) If you don't like it, I just flat out don't trust you. Yeah. It's It's how I feel about Trump supporters. It's like, really? Your judgment is that bad? The 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 only people I know who I am friends with who don't like this movie are cranky animation historians. Mm. (laughs) I feel like that's the only thing you're allowed to be. I don't want to know them then. You probably don't. I still don't want to know them. (laughs) I know John K. once called it one of the ugliest movies he's ever seen, which should have been a red flag. There were so many fucking red flags with John we should have noticed. I did. Nobody listened to me. People <laughs> people were like, oh, Kyle's just on his crap again. It's like, all right, well, y'all listen now, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know it's a great movie when even the author of the original book concedes that oh, it's yeah. just fantastic. He it's a piece is of art. so, like, I follow him on Facebook and he's so fully on board with this version of everything. Yeah, even though there were so many differences between the book and the movie, he's 1,000% on board with the whole Disney Roger Rabbit thing didn't he write a sequel to the movie that was not a sequel to his original book but a sequel specifically to the movie's universe i I feel like i've heard about that he just flat out abandoned his own universe in favor of the movie's universe i I think he actually (laughs) didn't he like go back and rewrite parts of roger rabbit to be more like the movie i don't know if he george lucas did but we're gonna go into the rabbit verse is what we're saying (laughs) yes down the rabbit hole (laughs) Ah! Can we copyright us impersonating Fozzie Bear to put on a t-shirt? Ah, <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> okay, never mind. I think that. we would run into Legally issues with that. dubious. I think we run into pretty much any issue. Do we have to get Amblin and Disney to sign off on it? Absolutely. Okay. Is somebody going in completely blind? I just know that I will probably absolutely adore these. Because <laughs> it's Roger Rabbit. I want Kyle to interject the Not a Burger Stand story relating to Roger Rabbit. Oh, sure. Mm-hmm. So at Not a Burger Stand, a restaurant that used to be right around here. They had a chalkboard, and between me and another artist who was also working there, Leela, we would take turns doing a caricature or a drawing of a character on there. And it was like, if you order in the voice of this celebrity or this cartoon character, you get 10% off your bill. Mm. But we would add stuff like, actually be so-and-so, and and your meal is free to see if we could get people to show up. (laughs) I did a Roger Rabbit one one day, and I wrote, be Charles Fleischer, and your meal is free, because I knew that he was, at least in the neighborhood, doing stand-up shows at Mm. Flappers. So I thought it was within the realm of possibility. And he did indeed show up and take a picture with the sign and post it on Instagram. He's cool that way. I've heard good stories about him being a nice guy. There was an HBO behind the scenes thing about Roger Rabbit where it showed him on set fully dressed up in the Roger Rabbit outfit. And he just comes up to the camera one point and he goes, I'm a rabbit. Three years of acting school and I'm a rabbit. Shakespeare and I'm a rabbit. You figure it out. Yeah, that was the thing. He insisted on going method with it and getting dressed up in a full-blown Roger Rabbit suit like you'd see at Disneyland, only without the face covering his face. I heard it also helped with the eyeline. Well, they used little dummies for I the eyeline. I think I saw that, too. Lou Hirsch, the voice of Baby Herman, said when he first saw Charles Fleischer dressed up as Roger, he said... If they think I'm wearing a diaper, (laughs) they got another thought coming. But also my favorite story about Charles Fleischer dressed as Roger is they were shooting in the same big studio complex at the same time as Superman 4, A Quest for Peace. (laughs) And Don Hahn, one of the producers, said he would go to the commissary and overhear like crew members of Superman 4 going, did you see that guy in the rabbit costume? That movie's going to be a disaster. (laughs) Doesn't even look like a rabbit. I love the idea of the crew of Superman 4 throwing shade at Roger Rabbit. <laughs> you know what's great about Superman 4 is John Cryer was one of Lex Luthor's henchmen. Mm-hmm. Fast forward to today on the CW Airverse, yep. John Cryer is Lex Luthor, yep, yep. and he's amazing at it. Circle of life. <laughs> I could be wrong about this, but I think most or all of these shorts were produced in Florida. At the Magic of Disney Oh, yes, that is absolutely true, actually, because Bill was telling me that they had lodging for everybody there. Mm. Yeah, they had opened Disney MGM Studios in Florida, and one of the big ideas behind it was, let's open a remote animation facility that can handle some of the overflow work of some of these features and also make some of their own stuff, and that can be an attraction at the park where guests can watch them at work. I think between them, they called it Artist Under Glass. Right, right. (laughs) I got Uh, to see them making a lad. Yeah. Oh, yeah? I was at the glass looking down, and there was somebody at a table and they were drawing characters that were later on in Aladdin. 
It's part of the reason why I consider it probably my favorite Disney film of all time, either that or Emperor's New Groove. For what little fraction of a second that thing was that I saw through the glass that day, I got to (laughs) see part of it, and that means so much to me. I kept wanting to see animators at work, but for some reason, I think I always would choose a weekend to visit Disney MGM, and it was barren, which was weird to me, because now I know that animators often also work on weekends just to meet deadlines. But for some reason, it seemed like whenever I went, no one was working there. The last time I saw that before it got totally shut down, Mm -hmm. we didn't even get to where the windows were. And they just Mm -hmm. had us all be in a room and they showed us on a screen the rigging of the computer model of the character Ben from Treasure Planet. And like that was them explaining animation to us. And I was just kind of like... This is, no, I did not come here for this. Yeah, by then, if they were plugging Treasure Planet, that would have been 2002, by which point the animation crew in Florida had been shut down or very close to it, where they were, everyone was just packing up their shit. Yeah, they probably shut the thing down, but they were like, oh, what are we going to do about this attraction at the park? And they were like, let's try whatever we can to make it work. And eventually, they just turned it into a meet and greet, and now it's just the Florida version of Star Wars Launch Bay. Um, Even though it's it's, no better than the California version. True. But I mean, at least that's in Tomorrowland. Like in Disney MGM, it's in the same park as Star Tours and Galaxy's Edge, but they're nowhere near each other. Oh, no, they're not. You know, I told you that they had lodging for the artists that they'd relocated there. I just Mm -hmm. remembered a wild story that Bill Cobb told me. He had a cat that gave birth, and he had to awkwardly give an explanation later as to why there was a giant blood stain in his closet. (laughs) Oh, God. Oh, that's, that is awkward. <laughs> Speaking of Florida lodging and Roger Rabbit, there is the giant Roger Rabbit at the Pop Century Resort. That's right. Which is really cool. So if you go stay at, is it the 1990s, I would assume? Probably the 80s, actually, because I imagine oh, wait, yeah, I they're guess. more desperate for stuff from the 80s that's iconic and memorable. Because, yeah, there's the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s, and they have way oversized Big fiberglass recreations of various characters and things from those decades. So for the 80s, we have a giant Roger Rabbit. I always try to stay at that place if I can. Well, now Pop Century is a Skyliner resort. So if you stay there, you can actually take the Skyliner into Hollywood Studios. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I know they call it the Skyliner, but fuck you. It's the Skyway. Let me have this. You you can. The Skyway's back. It's Skyway. Yay. It's a very, very fun My way or the Skyway. I was thinking it really loud. So there's that. We will be right back with our thoughts on the Roger Rabbit shorts, Tummy Trouble, Roller Coaster Rabbit, and Trail Mix-Up, right here on Escape from Vault Disney. Come on, come on home. See what, see what's waiting for you. Waiting for you. Okay, we just watched Kyle Carosa's guest choice of the Roger Rabbit shorts, Tummy Trouble, Roller Coaster Rabbit, and Trail Mix-Up. Holy shit, that was such the perfect antidote to the parent trap. Oh my god. I love cartoons, you guys. Cartoons are so wonderful. On our last episode, we were bitching about how the parent trap kept repeating everything and kept prolonging the movie and wasting so much screen time. It's great to watch something that doesn't waste a frame. (laughs) Every moment of these cartoons is just so jam-packed. You wouldn't change any of it. It's such perfect, brilliant cartoon anarchy. I love it so much. Thank you so much for making this your guest choice. (laughs) (laughs) You are so welcome. It's almost like cartoons with fast comedic pacing are really good and people should make more of them. (laughs) I know, right? And not complain on the internet about things being paced too fast. Luke, as usual, you're as subtle as a wet fart. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, there is such a thing as too much, but these were... No, there isn't. (laughs) But these were perfectly paced. Fast when they needed to be fast. But like, it makes such smart decisions. Like, for example, in Tummy Trouble... Right between two big, fast, frenetic scenes of Roger in the operating room, it cuts to Jessica Rabbit in a much slower and quieter scene that's mainly designed to be sexy. That's perfectly structured because it gives you a moment to breathe before we're on to our next manic set piece. It's so well done. And in the other two, it is particularly built to build. Yeah, all three of these are built to build. They all reach this frenzied pace by the end. These all basically are structured like the Something's Cooking short at the beginning of Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Baby Herman's mother leaves Roger to take care of Baby Herman. Baby Herman wanders off while Roger's distracted by something else and gets into very dangerous mishaps that only Roger recognizes the danger of. Baby Herman remains oblivious to it throughout. 
And Roger ends up being the one constantly getting hurt and getting maimed and getting all manner of glorious cartoon violence committed upon him. Along the way in all three of these shorts, there's a Jessica Rabbit cameo and a Droopy cameo, and then it ends with breaking the fourth wall into a live action setting. To quote Dana Carvey as George Michael, It's a formula, but it bloody works. I imagine if they had made a lot more of these, they may have had to eventually do something about the formula. But the fact that there's only three of them, it works perfectly. Well, four if you count the opening of the movie, but the formula doesn't wear out its welcome. Another thing we got to point out about how they're presented on Disney+, Plus. Disney saw fit to put the big-ass modern Disney logo in front of all three of them, which I get it, but... It's so out of place with the rest of the cartoon. Like, I know for movies, sometimes directors are allowed to play with the Disney logo and do Mm -hmm. new things with them. And here they just slapped the generic one on. It makes me think that the only reason why they slapped it on was because the Amblin Entertainment one shows up the end of each of the shorts, so they have to balance it out. Well, originally, the classic old school Disney logo was in front of all these. The blue screen and the castle outline. And I wish that was there because that's always been my viewing experience for these up until Disney Plus on their original releases and also on the best of roger rabbit vhs that's what was there if you did that on like an old looney tune you would get shot in the face i'm sure they've got some formula for it worked out but it's so erratic which titles on disney plus get to keep the old logo and which ones get the new one foisted upon them frankly we're lucky these are up at all yeah you're probably right i do want to quickly mention and this is kind of true of all three of them is just how nicely authentic the title cards look yes this old school airbrushing style which again straight from the 40s Still copying the formula set by something's cooking, obviously, but still, yeah, that is a lost art that these shorts temporarily brought back. (laughs) I'd love to see title cards like those return. That would be nice. They're doing them on the new Looney Tunes cartoons. I also noticed this, and this is more a comment on the original movie than these shorts, but when they made Who Framed Roger Rabbit, the first thing they put into production was the something's cooking short because they could basically animate that whole thing while they were shooting the live action bits of the movie. So it was just economical to do it that way. And as a result, it was clearly the first thing that Charles Fleischer had to record as Roger. And if you watch the movie, his Roger voice isn't 100% there yet. He Mm -hmm. hasn't quite figured it out. It actually kind of sounds like Gonzo. I'll feed you, baby! Yeah, it is kind of funny watching these in order. By the time he's even doing Tummy Trouble, he's sure. like got the voice completely down. Because not only has he done the whole movie, he's also done all this press for the movie. Because yeah. animation voices always evolve. Check out first season, Homer. So let's start with Tummy Trouble. Yes. Baby Herman swallows the rattle and he's perfectly fine, but Roger's freaking out about it. Why didn't anything happen to you? Why couldn't it happen to me? To me? And then it does. <laughs> A lot. So. <laughs> and then they take Roger, they strap him down, and then they push him through all these doors, oncology, yeah. gynecology, biology, into Burbank. <laughs> yeah, I never quite got that joke. Is it just a bit of random weirdness, or is there actually like a hidden joke there that I don't get? I've never been 100% certain, but I might be because of the notable hospital that's down the street from Oh, here. right. Which is right across the street from Disney. Exactly. The hospital where Walt died. Just to explain a pop culture reference for the youngins out there. In the 80s, there was a popular TV show about a hospital called St. Elsewhere. Yes. <laughs> so the hospital in this short is called St. Nowhere as a reference to that. So it's going to reveal that it was all in a snow globe the whole yes. time. And St. <laughs> Nowhere is my least favorite Metallica album. <laughs> all these cool little details in the Tummy Trouble short, like yeah. when he's in the hospital room, there's the skeleton of Mickey on yep. the wall. The picture of the mad doctor with his beard going right, over the right. frame. Once Roger swallows the rattle, it turns into the anatomy of a rabbit brain and it's just a peanut. Peanut, Yeah, (laughs) which I am going to put money down that that's a Bill Cop joke. (laughs) There's a Mickey mouse hole when they're outside of the elevator. Oh, really? In the house, there is a plush Raggedy Andy, Mm. which of course would be a reference to Richard Richard Williams' Raggedy Andy Dandy film. Even though Richard Williams was no longer on board with these things. Well, he did provide the voice of Droopy, so he wasn't entirely. In Tummy Trouble, he was Droopy. Right. But in the other two shorts, it was Corey Burton Burton. doing Droopy, because I think by the time they were making the second short, either Richard Williams was way too busy trying to make Thief and the Cobbler, Mm -hmm. or he had learned that Disney was ripping off Thief and the Cobbler to make (laughs) Aladdin, and he was like, fuck these people. Yeah. So I have a question. Who Framed Roger Rabbit has all the awesome cartoon characters from Mm -hmm. the 30s and early 40s in it. So why was Droopy the one that ended up being the 
random cameo character in these shorts. Do we have any idea why? I mean, I think in this one, it might just have been a callback to the elevator scene. That's right. Yeah. Probably. And yeah. then it's like, well, we put Droopy in the first one. Let's put him in the other two. It became like John Ratzenberger in Pixar movies, at least for a while. For because a while. we have Disney and Amblin controlling these two things. And then Droopy, according to the credits at the time, was owned by Turner slash MGM. Right. So it's like, we had to get them involved in this project. And too. hey, what was happening in Florida at that time? Disney, Disney MGM, MGM Studios. Studios. Exactly. I mean, there was no way they were ever going to get the Looney Tunes anymore because Warner Brothers was like, fuck this. We'll make our own fucking Roger Rabbit with basketball and hookers. <laughs> and the- Don't call Michael Jordan a hooker. Yeah. <laughs> How many commercials did he do? I mean, come on. 11. But Sydney, you pointed out when we see Jessica as the nurse. Yeah, the first thing I said was, hello, nurse. <laughs> <laughs> and I there wonder, could be something to that. I wonder if this was the inspiration for hello, nurse. Could very both, well be. Both Spielberg I never productions. put that together yeah. before, but that is highly likely. In all three of these cartoons, but I think especially in Tummy Trouble, Roger's facial expressions are so fucking magical. Oh, man. They, they're so it good. Is brilliantly, geniusly drawn. At points, it almost gets like Chuck Jones squared, in a sense. Just <laughs> when he's strapped to the table and he's tipping and about to fall over, and his face is just like that. Ah! Oh! <laughs> and then ah! he falls. Those two are such perfect drawings of Wild Take Rogers. Just this beautiful combination of the story people involved and animators happy to not have to hold back. <laughs> there are a few instances in here where I could see. In my mind's eye, the original drawing done by one of the story people that were translated into animation because the style of that story person shined through. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like when you see an episode of Magiswords that, say, Luke worked on, you can (laughs) see that we are adapting the Lukeness. So, like, when Roger's saying, I just need a bicob, I'll be fine. Those crazy teeth are exactly something Bill Cop would draw. <laughs> and then, like, the wild take when Roger sees the bill at the end is such a Pat Ventura drawing. Yes, the Dr. Bill huh. sadly has aged like wine. <laughs> the joke has gotten funnier over time. Yeah, it's, it's pretty much the only, like, standard 40s hacky comedy joke that has gotten better through time. <laughs> Time-tested jokes about women drivers and Dr. Bills. Because it's Meanwhile- still true. We live in hell. <laughs> Meanwhile, people in Canada... Canada and England is like, why would there be a bill? <laughs> <laughs> was this something in the 80s? Is this a reference yeah, the to Yeah, the last thing? door was Burbank, okay? <laughs> yeah, the last door was Burbank. <laughs> By the way, what's a bicarb? Oh, Alka-Seltzer. Oh, okay. Was that like the brand back in the 40s? The proper name is bicarbonate of soda, Alka-Seltzer oh, okay. uh, brand. I wasn't aware of that. Yeah. Oh, I guess he couldn't say Alka-Seltzer because that's a brand name. Right. That's yeah. a trademark. Sorry, I'm a million years old, so I know these things. <laughs> You would have to say adhesive bandage instead of band-aid. Adhesive right, medical right. strips. At the end, I love the fact that they were so committed to all of this that when they cut to the live action part, there were people who had to build the live action props that would be sitting around in the background mm-hmm. from earlier in the episode so that we could see like, oh yes, this is part of a whole movie set. So they had the cart with all the bottles on it that Jessica was pushing and all that sure, stuff. It's like, sure. It makes me wonder, where are those props? Because that would yeah. be something, if I was crazy rich and going to buy something, it's like, <laughs> I want that. I want the push cart or at least just one of the bottles from it or something. Honestly, they're probably all at Frank Marshall's house because <laughs> mm. why the fuck wouldn't he take as much of that cool shit as he could get by the way maybe this is just me but in the shot where baby herman is still stuck in the title card and he's struggling he's like get me out of here is it me or did that animation seem really milt collie i mean i can see that <laughs> i don't know just something I mean, about it you know that goes along with telling these animators not to hold back of course, sometimes that yeah. means they a lot of would these animators like to go full milt call a lot of these animators were personally trained by milt call exactly. so i wonder how milt call would feel about the fact that CG animators now is like, oh, you want a milk call head shake? <laughs> Control Alt Z. Uh, and like, oh, let me just pull that up, click, and then it just does the head shake automatically. There's more <laughs> to it than that. But yeah. He it, might feel it, better after he watches Klaus and sees what a love letter it is to his style. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so then we got Roller Coaster Rabbit from 1990. Right off the bat on Roller Coaster Rabbit, it has something that the other two don't. For some reason, after the title card, opening credits in it. Do you mm. think that was done to like, make Spielberg happy or something? It might have been. That might have been a concession. Some backdoor room where it happened deal making where it's like, okay, if we put your credit on front, then can we release this with Dick Tracy? Okay, but I get to cancel hair in my soup. That was noticeable to me as well. It didn't bother me per yeah. se, but no, like no. it was everything else was going so much for 40s authenticity. Right. And that was kind of the one thing that it wasn't. It did kind of stick out like a sore did, thumb. If they had done it in Trail Mix Up, I would have been like, okay, they just decided that's a thing they're going to do from now on. But the fact that it wasn't a Trail Mix Up is weird. Also, 
I didn't notice if the other two shorts had this, but Roller Coaster Rabbit had a skip intro button. It was only in that? And Which is weird. You're skipping like five seconds. Yeah. And the other thing that's different about this one is that it's listed under... It's under the extras for Who Framed Roger Rabbit. It's not listed as its own title. I remember when Disney Plus first launched, all three of these shorts were just extras on Who Framed Roger Rabbit. They weren't listed as their own title. Then for a while, all three of them were listed as their own title. And now for some reason, Roller Coaster Rabbit is just an extra and the other two are their own thing. Sometimes the largeness of Disney Plus makes things get weird. Indeed, yeah. As I said before, I'm just glad they're there. I mean, I don't know if this has anything to do with it, but it's also the only one of these three shorts that was rated PG instead of G. I've been trying to figure out why exactly. I, I, I assume it's the bull crash the bull grabbing. joke. Yeah. I would bet anything because the MPAA also gave Home on the Range a PG just for the line, yeah, they're real, quit staring. (laughs) I'm not kidding. According to the commentary, for some reason, I've actually listened to the Home on the Range DVD commentary. And according to that, yeah, that line alone got the movie a PG. Speaking of cows, Roller Coaster Rabbit has a Clarabelle cow cameo. That was cool. Yes. Yes. As As the the fortune teller. It's addressed in the movie when they borrow Dumbo. I got him on loan from Disney. Him and half the cast of Fantasia. The suggestion that maroon cartoons and Disney were somehow close to each other. Right, I would right. love to see like a mockumentary of the history of maroon cartoons. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I've always imagined if we follow the Roger Rabbit logic that all these cartoons were filmed and these characters were real... I always imagined these characters being so different than how they're portrayed on screen. Like, they had their personas that they knew how to play to the hilt, but I like to imagine once the camera shut off, Donald Duck was just the nicest guy in the world, (laughs) always signed every autograph for fans, never lost his temper, was probably basing the character off some toxic asshole he knew. (laughs) And meanwhile, Goofy is so deadly serious about the craft. (laughs) I'm methyled. And just never laughs at anything and takes everything deadly serious and insists on directing all his own cartoons and doing like 80 takes of everything everybody in france loves goofy (laughs) yeah exactly exactly who you see on the screen is goofy i'm george (laughs) geef and roger's kind of the only one who's pretty much the same off camera as he is on camera he's just naturally that guy the jack mcbrayer of cartoons exactly (laughs) did i tell you when we had jack mcbrayer on our voice director had to ask him to stop calling her (laughs) ma'am i swear just That is the most Jack McBrayer thing I've ever heard. (laughs) Such a sweet man. I realize that it's a cartoon universe within a cartoon universe, but it's still kind of fucked up that in a world with talking rabbits, there are shoot the rabbits booths and fairs. (laughs) Like, you know how those shooting galleries started, right? Like, you know the early histories of those things? No, no. Many of the earliest shooting galleries were some form of shoot the non-white person. Oh, good Lord. So this would be like if society never evolved. They're still fucking shooting rabbits. There is one joke in here that I know is Bill Kopsk because he reused it in a Pith Possum, Super Dynamic Possum of Tomorrow cartoon. Mm -hmm. The part where his head is shrinking and then it's tiny Mm. says, I got a headache, but it's just a little one. That's a really good Roger Rabbit, by the way. If if anything happens to Charles Fleischer, and if they ever do anything else with the character. It gives me hope that they even want to do something with Toon Spin. Oh, right. But yeah, in the Pith Possum cartoon, Return of the Dark Mask of Phantom Blackness, which I had to write down because all of the titles are like that. Mm. Pith Possum is fighting a monster, like a kaiju-type monster. He gets blown up to giant size, and in an attempt to turn him back to normal at the end of the cartoon, only his head returns to normal size. <laughs> and Pith says, Well, I've got a headache, but it's just a little one. <laughs> at some point, they moved from California to Florida. Because when they go up in the air in tummy trouble, they're in California, and they do the same, like, map gag, where they're yeah. miles above the surface of the Earth, and America is just mapped. <laughs> and in Roller Coaster Rabbit, they come down in Florida, so I guess it symbolizes the journey these characters took, where... Sure. If there's one thing you're going to see at a state fair in Florida, it's bull livestock. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's what that state is known for. <laughs> yes. I mean, I think it's just, for this one gag, we are in sure. Disney World. You've gone through the first dip, now you're going to go over the top and see the second dip of this roller coaster you're on you see like how long the roller coaster is how crazy and insane it is going into like that spiral like <laughs> effect that is so brilliant that whole segment of the short was like aquamania on crack the goofy short oh, yeah. where he's on the roller coaster but 
taking it even further, taking yeah. it so much crazier. This is true of all three of these. These are the answer to the question, what if a classic cartoon short existed where money was no object? Right, right. Yeah, they probably had more money to throw in this per capita than the movie because this is just a seven minute short and the movie's got to divide everything between 90 minutes or however long right. it was. Something that these shorts used really well, the beginning of using computers to animate things and figuring out how to apply that to hand-drawn animation so that they could have the roller coaster tracks and things like the Ferris wheel. That's doing all of the heavy lifting on animating those things and making them look real so that they can concentrate on making Roger and baby Herman as good as they possibly can. Yeah, and they can. used it on the logs in Trail Mix Up as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they managed to do it in a way that if you don't have the eye for that, it's integrated into it so well that it doesn't break your immersion of I'm yeah. watching a cartoon from the 40s or something. The bull voiced by Frank Welker, because of mm, course. Yes. Of course. When they do the thing where Roger's about to get pummeled by the bull and they keep moving the pan following baby Herman in the balloon but they still have the kind of earthquake shaky effect for when Roger gets pummeled. And I just I have to wonder, like, was that a computer thing or did they have to, like, do that in actual animation real time and make that work? Where the pan is fluid and following this track, but at certain points it's going to shake, 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 but then keep going and then shake, 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 and then keep going and have it be that fluid. I did love when the roller coaster's careening all over the place, the film projection gag. Yeah. yeah. That is yeah. pure Tex Avery. Yeah, that in is, fact, that's is... lifted directly from. Yeah, exactly. Well, possibly more than one takes Avery cartoon. Maybe it's also hidden because it could cause seizures. You know yeah, what? Yeah, actually. You're probably exactly right. But there's I other... put the warning in front of it. Incredibles 2 is on Disney+. Plus. They had to fucking put warnings in theaters for that one, so they could easily put a warning in front of it, but I guess they just can't be bothered. One thing I also noticed once they do the fourth wall break and get to the live action segment... Roger has fangirls? Yeah. <laughs> Roger Rabbit groupies, basically. I guess so. Well, it was established in the movie. I mean, Betty a big Boop star. Like, what a lucky coil. You know? yeah. That was so. Betty Boop, though. That was it. <laughs> well, Roger's obviously a sex symbol I, in that I, world. I guess. I mean, look at his wife. And also look at DeviantArt. People are into weird shit. Yeah, it's also <laughs> so let's move on to Trail Mix-Up. First of all, the description on Disney Plus of Trail Mix-Up says they're in Yellowstone National Park when the sign says Yellow, Yellow Stain, Stain. So yet again, Disney Plus lies to us. <laughs> they said we'd have the barefoot executive on day one, and we still don't have it. On that note, I love that they let them do these double entendre jokes right, and just right. let Roger Rabbit be Roger Rabbit and not step in and try to sanitize it. Just let him be horny for Jessica. <laughs> just let him. For something they were spending this amount of money on, I'm glad that they just let them Talk about be funny babes cartoons. in the woods. <laughs> you don't want to burn your weenie. I almost dropped a log. Yep. Good taste is timeless, and, <laughs> and good times are tasteless. Just referencing Jessica, the first one, she doesn't even have a spoken line until the end title sequence. Mm -hmm. And then the second one, there's the playtune gag, and then save me with Droopy. Save me. Save me. What? Save me! And then this one, she actually has sort of an active appearance. She has a whole scene. Yeah. Yeah. So I wanted to mention a couple of things. She doesn't have that much to do in the scene like, besides just be hot. There's a lot of Jessica Rabbit cosplayers out there who also cosplay that outfit of, mm. from Trail Mix-Up. I think I've seen like a nice statue of that outfit, too. If there had been more of these shorts, I would have liked to have seen a short where Jessica was more of an active participant in the cartoony tune, maroon tunes side of that whole universe rather than just being a one note joke. Well, that's what they're doing on the ride. Yeah. 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 And have any of you read the script for Toon Platoon? I haven't. I the, know of it. She had a more active role in that script. I haven't read these yet. I just downloaded all of these with intent to read all of them. But all of the Roger Rabbit comics, they also made a spinoff called Roger's Toontown, mm. where basically there were like three segments per book, one for Roger, one for Jessica, and one for Baby Herman. Oh, cool, cool. One of my favorite animation things happens in one of the first shots where Roger's pack of stuff explodes, and just to make Baby Herman cry, the cookies fall off of the yeah, top yeah. of the refrigerator. Reference to something's cooking. Cookie! You will notice that that falls at five frames on ones. Oh! Something falling at five frames on ones always gets a laugh. Every time Peter Griffin does one of his falls off of something, it is always five frames on ones. Huh. Something I discovered looking at stuff frame by frame back when I was in college. And I do notice all three of these shorts, there's always a moment where Roger just pulls this insane amount of stuff, including a kitchen sink, out of something. <laughs> Whether it's burping baby Herman or pulling stuff out of baby Herman's crib or... 
in this case, out of the big bag that Roger has to carry. The backgrounds are gorgeous in all of these. I feel like they're especially gorgeous in Trail Mix. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's such a tragedy that they stopped making these. Because, like, yeah. like, one thing that I started to see happen in this short, there were occasional scenes where things were a little bit more off-model just because of the way the animator drew it. That's something that they would do in old Looney Tunes. Like, people can point to, oh, that's a Rod Scribner scene. I would have loved to see them keep making these so that we see the model actively change depending on who is directing it or who is animating it the way it naturally happens when you make a bunch of shorts of things look at the first mickey short and look at the last mickey short and they look very different from each other i want to talk about some of the gags in this first of all the bug repellent was called mink off yeah reference to the director of the first two <laughs> shorts the b says goomba at one point yeah goomba Huh? So this should have been with the Mario movie. I actually wanted to make a reference to that gag specifically in an episode of Magiswords, and I wasn't allowed to say Goomba. Oh, man. <laughs> the most significant pop culture reference in this is to a Spielberg movie. Yes. yes yeah, the droopy cameo the droopy with Jaws, <laughs> where they got to use the actual Jaws music, because Spielberg has those connections. Right. <laughs> the second I saw the fan, I was like, it's droopy. It's got to be droopy. Yep. <laughs> it, it did not disappoint. <laughs> Gets in every time. I love the beaver so much. I love all of the new animal designs they did for this. I love the design of the beaver, how he almost never changes facial expression. Yeah. He just <laughs> the sound design of the chainsaw noise being how yes. what it sounds like when he like, eats through a tree. The gag where he bites Roger's tail is so well-timed. It's so perfectly yeah. everything about There's it. There's a is... lot of impeccable timing in this one. Like, Definitely. When you think that they're finally done with their roller coaster of stuff and then the boulder falls off of the hill. <laughs> yes. Another <laughs> tiny little thing that gets the biggest laugh out of me and got a huge laugh out of you as we were watching. When they land on the boulder, camera zooms out to reveal it's teetering on the edge of a cliff <laughs> and baby Herman's little, uh-oh. <laughs> what was the name? I want to say it's like Humphrey or something. The bear from old Disney. Humphrey, Humphrey the, the bear. bear yes. Yeah, Humphrey the bear. I'm kind of surprised that they didn't just use Humphrey the bear. I think if he was going to have less screen time, they might have done that. But also Humphrey's a little bit more of a 50s design than a 40s design. Oh, that okay. is true. Yeah, it wouldn't have quite worked. The bear was very Humphrey-esque in this. Yes. The sawmill. <laughs> it's like, not the sawmill. If they're, gonna, if they're rebuilding stuff for like a new skyline, please just put the sawmill in the background. <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> Another amazing freeze frame gag is when Roger's on the giant log and he's getting hit with the other log and you keep seeing these little flashes of Roger just getting mangled and shit. In one of them, he's just bubble gum. He's just like... <laughs> used gum and in another he's relaxing with a tasty yeah. beverage <laughs> the live action ending of this has the most insane goddamn random ass ending and i couldn't love it more because <laughs> first of all they fucking destroy mount rushmore awesome yeah. fuck you mount rushmore the more you know about the history of how mount rushmore came to be the more cathartic that goddamn <laughs> scene is where the yeah, president got a pretty big laugh out of the take yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the fucking... it's also the fact that the president were screaming as yes! for impact. That's so ridiculous. perfect. <laughs> I noticed another freeze frame gag. When they're flying into South Dakota, the sign says, Raul J. Raul, governor. <laughs> Whoa, cool. So, so I was like, oh, okay, apparently he's moved on. Went full Jesse Ventura and fucking <laughs> used his Hollywood clout. He's just asking questions. They do the artistically beautifully rendered take of the president's doing the, ah, and then they cut to... Somebody had to build that take. Build yeah, that model. Up. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like maybe they knew this was going to be the last Roger Rabbit short. So they're like, fuck it. We got to go out on a bang. We got to build this whole Mount Rushmore model and just blow it up and then just destroy the world. Literally. Yep. The last moment. It's not the end of the world. He pokes a flag in the ground and it causes the earth to deflate <laughs> and careen throughout the galaxy. That is the most fucking high at 3 a.m. gag you will ever find in a production this expensive, and I love it so goddamn I'll God say it well. again. So I love cartoons. Yes. In the Roger Rabbit universe now that it's deflated. <laughs> That's why there was no more Roger Rabbit shit after this, because Roger destroyed the world. I killed everybody. <laughs> well, I do believe the time has come to answer that question that has baffled both mankind and Toonkind through the ages, namely, what's the attraction? <laughs> so obviously we got Roger Rabbit's cartoon spin at Mickey's Toontown at Disneyland, but 
that's pretty much the only Roger Rabbit ride that's ever been built. Originally, they were going to build the Toontown Trolley at Disney MGM. That ended up not happening. But now these shorts are going to be the most watched titles on Disney Plus because people are going to finally snap to their senses and <laughs> watch them and enjoy them, damn it. So Disney's going to want to make more Roger Rabbit stuff, particularly based on these shorts. How are they going to do that? Kyle, the souvenir wild take experience. Someone will scare the ever loving crap out of you and you will make an absurd wild take. And then someone will have to 3D print or somehow otherwise sculpt the insane face that you just make. And then you can take it home with you. <laughs> Luke, there's going to be a new meet and greet Roger Rabbit experience, except it's not the usual Roger Rabbit. It's Charles Fleischer in the outfit. <laughs> Sydney? The Splash Mountain re-theme at Walt Disney World will no longer be Princess and the Frog. It will now be the Sawmill. Hell yeah! yes! Oh, Woo! Don't threaten me with a good time. <laughs> well, unfortunately, and I mean unfortunately, because I love that Sawmill idea, you're all wrong. Ten times. What they are going to do is open a new restaurant where they serve Rocky Mountain oysters that you get to pick yourself. <laughs> <laughs> and then a bull attacks you and you go on the big ass roller coaster that sends you hurtling up into space. And then you get to blow up Mount Rushmore just for the hell of it. <laughs> and that lands you in the first aid center where your nurse is Jessica Rabbit. You know, somehow I don't think Bob Chapek's chilling out for this. So, <laughs> final verdict, folks. I know I don't even have to ask, but are these Roger Rabbit shorts Disney pluses or Disney minuses? Sydney? As somebody who just watched these for the first time, definite Disney plus. If you even remotely like who framed Roger Rabbit, this is a wonderful continuation. And who the hell doesn't? Yeah, yeah exactly. I already said I don't want to be friends with them. Then you will <laughs> absolutely adore these shorts to accompany that amazing movie. Luke? That would be a Disney bluff. <laughs> Kyle? Tony, absolutely the Disney plusest ever. Well, it is unanimous. God, these cartoons are amazing. If you were to ask someone to come up with a platonic ideal of the concept <laughs> of a cartoon, you could do a lot worse than this. Yeah, this but is these are just amazing. I'm so glad they were made. I wish there were more of them, but you know what? I'm glad that all three we got were absolute masterpieces because yeah. yes. you might have some diminished returns if they'd been forced to make more of them and just crank them into the ground. They did not run these into the ground. Maybe they weren't allowed to run them into the ground. Maybe they wanted to make more and couldn't, but whatever. Yeah, there wasn't even a chance to jump the shark. <laughs> if Spielberg was willing to bring back Animaniacs, Maybe something could happen. Who knows? Maybe. I mean, they've been trying to get new Roger Rabbit stuff off the ground forever. There's been various scripts in development, which I talked about when I was on How Did This Not Get Made? But I guess we'll see. Maybe one day. They do seem to be rebooting absolutely fucking everything these days. So, well, frankly, I would rather have more shorts than another film. Me because, too. Like, I, I honestly would, I too. I trust more shorts to be good than I do another film to be good. Absolutely. Yes. I mean, if new Looney Tunes has proved anything, it's there are honestly, people yeah. excited about making stuff like this. <laughs> <laughs> Who's got stuff to plug? If you want to check out my professional type website, go to kylecarosa.com, C-A-R-R-O-Z-Z-A. If you would like to see artwork that I'm currently doing, check out TVS, K-Y-L-E, TV's Kyle on Instagram. Hey, I'm Luke, and I am a storyboard artist looking for places to do storyboarding for money. So if you would like to hire me, go check out my storyboard portfolio at www.luke.ski. That's S-K-I. And if you're interested in voiceovers, go to luke.ski slash voiceover, because I would like to continue working in this awesome industry that makes things like the Roger Rabbit shorts. If you'd like to see me prove that Ian Lightfoot's boyfriend is canon, you can follow me at the Derpy Hipster, both on Instagram and Twitter. Great little place where you get to see and hear my Disney thoughts. And as always, you can follow me on Twitter at Tony Goldmark, and you can also follow this show on Twitter at EFVD Podcast. I've also got a Facebook fan group you can join called Some Jerk with a Fan Club, and I've got a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Tony Goldmark, where you can find all three seasons of my web series, Some Jerk with a Camera, along with a bunch of other videos about movies and theme parks, and even a scant few episodes of this very podcast. You can find every episode of this podcast at pipedreampodcast.com, as well as all the usual outlets like 
like Spotify, Audible, Apple Podcasts, and Google Play. If you like what you've been hearing and you'd like to help us out, please subscribe. Please leave a review. Please give us five stars. All that stuff helps us get discovered by the almighty algorithm. If you'd like to help us out even more, you can donate to my Patreon, patreon.com slash Tony Goldmark, where if you pledge any amount, even the bare minimum of a dollar a month, you get to hear new episodes of this podcast one day early on Tuesdays instead of Wednesdays. Once again, that's patreon.com slash Tony Goldmark. Special thanks to all my patrons. You don't know how much it means to me. And also, once again, a very special thanks to you, Kyle Carroza, for choosing these amazing Roger Rabbit shorts as your guest's choice. My absolute pleasure. Next week, we are back to using the almighty randomizer to select our topic. And I am joined now by one of my guests on next week's episode, Kit Leitmeyer. How you doing, Kit? I am doing good and ready to push the button. I was just going to ask, are you ready to push the button and read off the randomizer's pick for next week? Oh, I'm sorry. I took that away from you. No, that's okay. We'll just pretend time goes backwards. I don't like that idea. That's okay. Smart house. Initiate random shuffle mode, please. Initiating random shuffle mode. Make a selection. And the winner is... Birth of Europe. Birth of Europe. That sounds like a Nat Geo thing. Is that a Nat Geo special or a Nat Geo series, I wonder? Okay, it's a series, so let's see how many episodes there are. Three episodes. Okay. Kid, if you'll be so kind as to open a new tab and Google random number generator, plug in one through three and see what it gets you. We got number three. Number three. That would be episode three, Fire. All right. Join us next week on Escape from Vault Disney when we will cover Nat Geo's Birth of Europe, episode three, Fire. Come on home where your video's playing. It's true. Come where your family is waiting for Walt Disney and you. Walt Disney and you. Walt Disney and you. It's not like it's the end of the world.